Well, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us and giving up your evening. Um, as uh, Leslie's mentioned in numerous times, there's a good uh, good demand of people over there interested in learning a bit more about um, how Andrew is doing things. So this is really set up to educate everybody as to um, what he's managed to do over the last two years uh, on farm. So look, just to give you a quick overview and introduction, I'm uh, Jolly and Ludbrook, the marketing manager for the parent company that manufactures the tow and fit machines here in Dannyvirk, New Zealand. Um, I'm actually coming to you from the Bay of Plenty, um, where I work for three weeks out of every four, and then I spend a week down in Dannyvirk with the team down there as well. We've got uh, Tim Henman, who's our sales manager out of Metalform. He's on the line too. Uh, he'll be taking us for a factory tour a little bit later on. We've got Michael Smith. Michael Smith is Mr. Toenfurt. He's the sales uh, manager for Toenfurt in New Zealand here. Um, and also the sort of uh, the go-to guy for pretty much just about anyone with questions on the Toenfurt. We've got Andrew Reese, who's our star performer today. And then of course, we've got Leslie Dwyer on the line as well, um, who most of you have probably come into contact with at some point. Um, and then we've got Neil from uh, our cousins over in Aussie, um, who's the sales manager for uh, our Australian um, business over there. So that's the lineup of the Tone Fit team, if you like, here today. Um, the outline for what we're going to do is we're going to have a short presentation from Mike, uh, Mike Smith, um, about the different machines. He'll give us a bit of a background on what he's done first with the Tone Fit over the years. Uh, and then we'll dive headlong into Andrew's presentation, which is obviously the focus of the day. Following Andrew's presentation, Tim is going to take us for a quick tour of the assembly area of the factory in Dannyburg. And following that, we will get headlong into questions. So if you wouldn't mind holding on to your questions, you can post them in the chat function um, of Teams and you can find the chat function. It's a little sort of speech mark icon um, which will be on your screen somewhere and it will when you hover over it it will say show conversation and you can type your message at the bottom of that or your question at the bottom of that we will endeavor to get through everyone's questions but we may not be able to so we will select those um, uh, as they come up as to which ones we can uh, we can present to one of the team to uh, to work through with you or for you so look, we'll get underway. Um, I'll introduce Mike. Mike is, as I mentioned, our sales manager here at Tarnford in New Zealand. Um, he's had a long background in dairy farming and uh, with the Tarnford. So, Mike, I'll hand over to you before I bring up the, or and I'll bring up the uh, the presentation shortly as well. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Michael Smith, as Jolene said, um, dairy farming. So 20 years dairy farming. Um, started back in 2013, I got a time for it and started contracting um, down in the South Island, um, right down the bottom. So I did that for five years um, and then an opportunity to move on from that and get involved with time for it, um, and helping promote it to people around the world come up. So yeah, jumped on board, took on that um, and currently have a son as well that's contracting with the time for it. So still involved in the farming sector, helping him out and getting on with that as well. So there's not a lot that I haven't done, haven't seen, haven't failed at trying or succeeded at trying with the time fit. Um, so my knowledge is quite broad with it. So yeah, any questions that anyone can't answer for you, just give us a call, the chances are I probably have done it. Um, yeah, so we'll move on now to a little presentation Jolien's done. Um, and yeah, I'll talk you through it. All right, can everybody see that? Just just like Mark, you can see yeah. that? No, yeah, we can now, yep. Good. Okay. So, yep. So, yeah, Tom Fert started about 2009, I think it was, with their first sort of prototypes of manufacturing. Um, and in that time, the, the machines have evolved. The basic theory behind it all is the same the whole time, um, just improvements from an operator point of view and manufacturing point of view, which have made the machines better and more user friendly. Um, so starting here, you can see what the 500 litre one, this is the baby of the of the team. Um, been out for not quite a year now. Um, so to give you an idea, the, the volumes are all there. So five, 500 litre capacity, um, so 400 litres of water, a couple hundred kilos of urea. Um, that will dissolve down in three to four minutes. And yeah, travelling at the speeds, you can get out there and get it done. Um, and fine particle, we've tested this with about 350, 400 kilos of fine particle lime in it. 
So that's the capacity of the part particulates that it can go down to. Um, string operated, um, fill it with a hose, so pretty basic, but there is options to go to electronic control and a suction kit to be able to self fill itself. So from here we move on to the 1200 litre one. So this is the only three point linkage machine we have. It's 1200 litres designed around a half tonne bag of urea. Um, so yeah, 1000 litres of water, half tonne of urea that will dissolve in sort of four to five minutes and then you're out spreading it. Um, we have had a, a tonne of lime flour on one of these, but yeah, you're sort of starting to get to the limits there, what it can suspend in suspension. Um, you can also add a wheel kit to this machine. Um, you can dual boom it, which will take you out to sort of 20 metre spread. And you can, yeah, electronically actuate it when it goes to dual booms. You can have scales on it. So yeah, very simple, easy machine if you wanted to put it on the back of the tractor. Um, then we move on to our 2800. This is designed around a one ton bag of urea. So 2000 litres of water, a ton of urea. Um, you yeah, get into pretty much with your particulates, lime flour, for instance, it's nearly a kilo to a litre. So this machine will hold not quite three ton of lime flour as it's it's getting to its maximum. It's not something I'd suggest you start while you're learning, but certainly that is the capabilities of it. Um, you can add a, a higher crane to this, so it's just one machine, one tractor required. It self loads itself. It's on scales. It has brakes, um, dual boom, and it's spreading between 18 and 24 metres depending on what you put in the machine. Um, you'll see on this one it's got a PDO shaft. The PDO shaft just for the agitation mixing system in the bottom. Um, all the machines run the same pump for the actual application of it, right from our little one um, has a smaller impeller in it, but right from our little one to our biggest one, we run the same pumps on them. Um, yeah, the 1000 litre one, you can have petrol or hydraulic drive. The little 500s just petrol drive. Um, and then, yeah, the rest of them moving up are all hydraulically driven. Um, then we move on to our big 4,000. So this is the big girl. Um, she'll take one and, a, one and a half ton of urea in 3,000 litres of water. Um, mix mix that in three to four minutes. Um, same ratios of mixing stuff as well, the other machines. Um, the, the machines come with an app so that in the app you can just go through, basically tell the, tell the app what you want to do per hectare. So for instance, you rear at 40 kilos um, or 50 kilos and move your way through. It'll tell you how much you rear to put in, how much water to put in, how much of all the other products you want. It'll tell you the spray width, the speed to travel, tells you everything. Um, the app's pretty pretty accurate. So if you believe the app um, and just, it'll, it won't put you wrong. Um, it knows what limits to, to go to without causing you any trouble. Um, yeah, so we can also section control most of the machines, which gives you the ability to run one nozzle only instead of having to run two all the time. So different shape paddocks or small runs, you can turn one nozzle off, stop over overlapping and using more FERT. So that there's a bit of an overview of the Tom FERT range and a little bit about the abilities of what they can do. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, all right, Andrew, are you ready with your presentation? Let's get into it. And um, if you can share your screen, uh, people will see his uh, presentation come up shortly. Just a reminder to those of you uh, online, if you haven't already uh, turned off your or muted your sound, please do so. Uh, the feedback can be quite disruptive uh, in the uh, whilst the guys are trying to present. So, uh, most of you are. I think we're okay for now, but just keep that in mind. All right, good evening everyone. Um, thanks Darren and uh, Leslie and the team Town for, for inviting me to present this evening. Um, our last 18 months over in Town 2800. Um, of course, presentation, I have to give a bit of a background uh, to our decision and the justification for why we purchased one and the results we've achieved so far. So a little background to Right. A little background to our farm, uh, more farm family farm. I'd be the third generation farm here. Um, farms effectively in two blocks. We have about 105 hectares open, accessible as a milking platform, and then further 50 hectare for young stock and silage making. Uh, we peaked this year 350 cows. Um, 
probably average something between 330 and 340 for the season. Uh, Pedigree British Friesian registered under the Warwin prefix. Um, also carrying our replacement heifers, R1s, R2s, and we also breed in bulls, um, a small number for sale. Big sort of boom for us in the last 12 months. We've managed to get a breeding bull into AI stood for the first time. So this is a picture of uh, Walwyn Epic, who is currently available with Genus. So our farm, we're a spring, single block spring calving farm. We've typically calved February, March each year for the last 10 years. However, next year we are moving to calve in March and April instead. Grass is the is the basis to our operation. We graze as much as we can. Grass is number one feed input. Well, we do also feed about 1.2 tonnes of concentrate on the parlour and up to about 300 kilos of maize solid head in early lactation. Typically yield 6,000 to 6,200 litres per cow per year, which is around the 480 kilos of milk solids. Herd's quite young at the moment. We've been growing herd every year for the last 10 years. So we're at our number now, so as herd matures, we'll get back over 500 kilograms of milk solids where we've been before. In the last 10 years, we've preceded probably the whole farm. In the last couple of years, we've introduced more multi-species lays, and probably about 12% of the farm now is in uh, multi-species lays, ideas for diversity and its uh, benefit towards soil health, and also our aim towards reducing chemical fertiliser inputs. A picture of our R1s enjoying a mixed species forward last summer. So, what led us to the total fit? I suppose the last three years um, has been quite. I've done quite a bit of learning into soil health and its impacts on what we do. So much from observing animal behaviour. This project was all. I remember this evening moving the cows, up, turning cows through to a fresh break sort of what would be deemed perfect pasture, cover, quality, etc. And a big pile of them just piled, decided to go graze the hedge instead. Um, so it is starting to question, well, is what we perceive to be right, what is right for the animal? So also reading um, the likes of Gabe Brown, Dave Montgomery, Gary Zimmer, Nicole Masters, all sort of seven seeds of questioning what we're doing. On top of that, there's um, um, let me say, yeah, audio books, podcasts. The, well, there's a moment of information at the moment it, it, it is huge. So I suppose it's, it's basically asking what, what our actions are doing to the ecosystems we manage um, and what negative effects basically have led to our reliance on chemical fertilizer inputs. And on top of that, sort of in terms of personal development, I'm also trained now in holistic management. Did that with the UK hub of the um, Saber Institute. And also done a soils masterclass online with Nicole Masters. So it's all built around knowledge of how we can improve our soils to, to benefit our farm. For this learning, obviously nitrogen played a big part of our um, annual budget each year. So that was a good place to start in terms of reduction or where we could reduce. So basically, how can we get more bang for our buck? So then, um, it's basically understanding what nitrogen use efficiency is. It's not necessarily making the plant more efficient, it's actually reducing how much we actually lose um, to either the air through volatilization or through the soil, through leaching, which ends up in our water courses. Um, so there's, there's a few sort of um, go-tos in terms of what the best sort of response is. So the first one is always apply carbon with nitrogen. Um, it's often in the form of humates or could be as simple as molasses. A lot of studies show this is up to a 30% improvement in use efficiency as well. Second to that would be foliar. This is applying it directly as a solution onto the plant leaf. So it's taken in by the uh, plant's leaf stomata cells. So we're bypassing the soil and, the, and being taken in by the roots. So you're not ending up with sort of nitrogen in the soil solution. Um, and again, adding your carbon source to that with the um, your sort of fulvic and humic acids makes it more readily pass through the cell wall. We tend to use urea is what's recommended for foliar application as urea is considered an amide, which is only a step away from amino, which are amino acids and the building block blocks of protein. So we're not going through several steps of the nitrogen cycle. 
Thirdly, examine our soils in balance. This would be as all our base saturations, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. These help determine our soil structure, which helps uh, determine the passage of nutrients in the soils as well, and what's effectively, what effectively available to the plant. But then it's also about knowing what nutrients are already in our soils. Last year, we conducted a handful of what they call total um, soil analysis, is sort of what's actually in the soil stock, not necessarily available to the plant, but what's actually there. So you can see sort of what circled on the page there, that we have got tons of potash and phosphorus available, well, not available to us, but in the soil, in this case of how do we access that. So it's improving the biological function of the soil to access that without continuing to add and spend to add more to that bank, as particularly in the case of phosphate, something like 50% of applied phosphate becomes unavailable within six weeks. It also goes to then trace elements as well. We've got a huge impact, a huge store of trace elements in our soil. Um, and it's amazing, our manager has made them unavailable due to lack of diversity in terms of reconstruction and um, soil microbiology. So we need strategies well soils improve because um, it's not a easy fix or a quick fix so it's using strategies um, in the meantime to maintain plant performance but also our actions not continue to detriment what we've done in the past so the tone fit uh during a lot of this sort of reading things this this machine kept popping up um there's a lot of information from new zealand out there on it um so thought no better than sort of to find out more so probably about this time uh, about two years ago i think i spoke to tim uh and tim put me in touch with leslie so then early january last year 2020 a whistle stop tour of um island met two farmers one in cork one in tipperary uh who had had 1200s for a couple of years and we're getting really good results so although we felt the 1200 is perhaps a bit small for our operation uh leslie informs 2800 is available so we went for the 2800 placed our order and the machine arrived in early may then 2020. we might touch on some of the visibility of the tone fit um but there's a well there's a fairly endless list of what can go through so we can put our carbon sources in, whether that's humates or molasses. We can buy humates in granules, not reliant on um, it having to be in solution because the machine is capable of dissolving it. And also case of molasses, um, often with people trying to put crop molasses through a crop sprayer, it can cause nozzle block issues, but that's not an issue with the tone fit. Basically any soluble fertilizer uh, will pass through the machine. Um, in terms of biology, biology and biostimulants, that could be like brewed things. And we have used tried bits where they have a fertilizer brewing up um, bacterial bacterial brews um, to try and inoculate the soil to get a bit of a kick. But there's also things like perhaps fish or seaweed. Uh, lime, ultrafine lime, we've used ultrafine lime in replace of perhaps like some products like Calcifert, um, buying as pretty much cubicle lime for one of a better description, and the works out a bit cheaper than the Alexi like Calci fit. Um, it's obviously held in suspension rather than dissolved, but the sort of the design of the tome of it allows it to be circulated around the booms. And then also capable we've used uh, small seeds, chicory, plantain, and clover through the machine as well. So these figures are from just well, fertilizer prices are to December 2019. Uh, later presentation, I got some up to date figures for price comparison. But this is the figures I use for justification to go ahead and purchase a tome of it. Um, I typically start sort of nitrogen use and then using the 40% reduction in nitrogen um, that tome of it claimed. It also, not what they claim, but also backed up by a lot of the research I had done. It's also accounting for a few additional inputs into the tone fit, such as our carbon source and a um, OptiM, which is sort of a wetting agent to keep the uh, solution wetter on the leaf for longer to allow the plant to take it in, as well as a few trace elements. It resulted, still gave out a sort of a very substantial saving in fertilizer costs, although there's different cost to the machine, it meant the machine was paying for itself in about two years. Um, it wasn't only the sort of saving in actual straight in nitrogen, 
is also the products we use to get the nitrogen from. So we tended to use a mix of CAM27 and Hummer Palmer's 19, um, which per unit N worked out more expensive than urea, and urea tends to be the cheapest form of N. Um, so it was a sort of a double saving then, which, which, which really did add up. There are negatives. Anything, not everything is uh, rainbows and unicorns. Um, you've got to count compared to a solid fit spreader that fill time does add up. Um, if you set up well with infrastructure, it doesn't have to add too much time, but it is a consideration. Weather windows, um, midsummer, scorch hot afternoon, you don't really want to be going out to risk of leaf scorch. Wind is less than issue may consider being liquid application as a quite a coarse droplet. I think if you were willing to go 24 metres solid fit, you'd probably be fairly safe um, with the tone fit as a liquid. Um, and the other one, sort of, I, I found having had a variable rate solid spreader before, it, which would adjust the rate comparable to your forward speed, um, it's sort of slight change going back to having to stick to a chosen forward speed. So it's important to know your terrain before deciding your mix and, 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 and your application rate, so you know your forward speed. But again, that's knowing your farm is, is, is that's quite simple to work out. So the breakdown results um, compared to well, our last three years then. Obviously 2020 was sort of a half year for us as the machine arrived in May, we already spread a, a good chunk of our annual fertiliser. So the top line is our nitrogen use on our milking platform and in brackets the range between paddocks. Um, measure growth is off our Agrinet software. Now, I'm not the most religious measure every week, so there's some growth being lost, probably not measured within that as well. Um, so that's why I've tried to quantify that then in terms of our milk soil production, our stocking rate and our spend on purchase feed for livestock unit. Obviously our 2021 figures are provisional at the moment, but we haven't got far to go in the season. Um, So our plan for 2021 was to was target about 120 kilos, but due to weather, we sort of, we missed a lot of rain this summer. I think probably about half our expected rainfall for April to the end of August. Um, so we tend we were tend to run a slightly longer round, so probably less opportunity to apply, um, and also slightly aiming for slightly longer growths to get through sort of drier spells too. Um, you can see our stocking rate has raised a fair bit there. Uh, we are under TB restriction at the moment since May. Uh, we had did have a group of cows we had planned to sell fairly fresh and some uh, young heifers as well. We might have to, have to keep them on farm. In addition to this, we also got 30 hectares of size ground we cut um, for two cuts. So that's not included in our stocking rate because we only have it available just for four months but it would be included in the purchase feed price. So to transfer that into a total spend, um, as you can see by this year, we make considerable um, saving on our annual fertilizer spend. Um, in addition, 2019 perhaps looks a bit better than it perhaps is because it's about 15 hectare in that 155 that we purchased that year and we didn't actually take much off it at all that year although there would have been a little bit of fertilizer spend on there but we spent most of the year putting it straight so we've met our 50 percent saving that we planned as sort of our justification predicted um there's some slight additional spend in our fertilizer budget too planned as we've sort of been trying out different things in terms of like bacterial brews or a few different inputs just experimenting but it's it's small proportionally to the overall spend and on top of all the ob obvious financial benefits this side of it is what's probably pleased me the most um we've had a phenomenal year for fertility Granted, every cow has had a month extra rest from calving because we've delayed to move our calving date. 
but in previous years we've served for 12 to 13 weeks all AI, but this week, this year we only did nine and a half uh, all AI again um, with zero vet intervention pre-service, every but one cow cycled. I wasn't getting the vet out for one, so she hit the cull list. Um, so yeah, absolutely stoked with those results that year, this year. And other health as well. Um, I put these numbers together middle of last week and I'd call with Leslie had last week and I couldn't quite actually believe what we denied. So I actually went back on the weekend and counted up through the vet invoices how many tubes we'd bought just to compare. And I think I might have missed recording one case. Um, and then talking to guys, man, we did cull two cows which were on our cull list and had started mastitis. So we might be able to bump that to 2021 figure up to about four and a half, but it's still a considerable reduction um, to the past. I think there's a tentative link to milk urias there. We run quite low milk urias most of the year and we didn't have a case, I think, May to early August. And then I think when a bit of the rain came in August, milk urias did jump up a bit and we had a couple of cases then. Um, the age wasn't conclusive enough to draw, I didn't think about drawing up a graph, but I couldn't, it didn't look a big enough trend, but just just gave you the feeling of the almost you could feel it coming, sort of it would come on to know, sort of done consistency, very consistent throughout the year. Um, far less nervous in the parlour when a cow coughed. And cows, so content, uh, often used to find in the past that if you had a dry spell, and a period of rain that the following two weeks cows be fairly unsettled and you'd almost ban anybody from starting the quad bike because all you do would be cows moving afterwards but we didn't seem to get that now that the grass was definitely satisfying and a lot better than they have in the past um so i think adding all these things together it's it's, it, it, it is a systems approach. It's not just what's what what's one thing. It's not just sort of saving action. It is the additional benefits it all brings. So sort of healthier cows, sort of healthy soil, healthy plants, and healthy cows. Um, which this, as I say, this side, this side of it has really made me more pleased about think than, than saving the money on sort of our fertilizer budget. So just a bit of background, well not background, but sort of indicator to the difference in terms of using tone fit to apply fertilizer as opposed to so say solid fit. Um, in the past we typically would follow cows with solid fit as close to grazing as possible. Whereas when we're aiming sort of for more of a foliar application, you're looking to apply around that sort of two two mark in terms of cover. So we're typically targeting like the middle third of the wedge rather than the first third. The one benefit this does give us is when you pull into a paddock, if you feel growth is good and grass colour is nice and green, then you've got the opportunity perhaps to skip an application that perhaps this paddock doesn't need at this time round. So there's additional savings can be made there rather than blindly applying every round uh, following the cows. So this last season, this was typically our mix following um, within sort of like the main part of the grazing season. We use two, so two sources of nitrogen. Sulfate ammonia is mainly for the sulfur, so we're aiming for a 10 to 1 nitrogen to sulfur, a little bit of mag. Then the humate we're using is Nurturen from Ava Fertilizers. That's actually a mix of humic, fulvic, um, and fermented molasses. And then the Optien, as I mentioned earlier, is through Leslie. Um, he's sort of developed with the guys in Ireland for more for our weather conditions. So just keeping that solution on the leaf that bit longer to um, give the plant a chance to take it in and increase efficiencies a bit more there. Um, you see the figure on the bottom of the table there, but summarise on the next slide, the, that basically adds up to 80 kilograms of M a hectare application, which would be equivalent to say a 30 kilogram in a granule application as ammonium nitrate. So that's about £21 at today's prices per hectare per application. And if we multiply that out to farm scale, if you were typically a 240 kilos a year user, then we could easily say go back, we could get back to 160. Um, so there's always saving quantities there. And then obviously moving from ammonium nitrate to urea, there's a saving. Um, so then I've, I've broken it just down there. It's, just, just all different farm sizes, 80, 150 and 250. But the, the savings across the, the bottom line there are, are quite quite clear to see.
So conclusion from our farm would be for 18 months of owning a tow and fit is we have reduced our own use by 63% halved our annual fertiliser spend and we have healthier and happier cows. Um, it's important to say that the, the machine itself isn't a silver bullet, there's the work behind it in terms of improving soils, make, so that also makes nutrients more available to the plant, um, but the machine definitely helps in its versatility for us to achieve those things. Um, so going forward for us, tissue we'll make more use of tissue testing. Um, so knowing what, it's all very well sort of soil tests and knowing what's in the soil, but what's actually transferring to the plant. So then it helps us determine what is our limiting factor, because quite often nitrogen isn't the limiting factor in terms of nutrient. So then the tone then gives us that flexibility to add what we need to. Um, but also to buy trace elements in their raw form, say copper sulfate, zinc sulfate, rather than paying a company to make that up into solution, which they'll charge that much more for. And then we also got the option whether to go foliar, because um, efficiency gains for foliar and other trace elements as well as nitrogen, um, or we can try and correct our soil balances. And then on top of that, other things I'd like to try, um, there's some, some sort of reading and things like that, is I would like to give Vermicast a good go. Um, the machine then gives the opportunity to sort of apply extracts so we can apply small amounts um, or make Vermicast go a lot further across the farm, which Vermicast is what they call it, a black elixir. It's full of humic and fulvic substances, plant growth hormones. Um, Quite available nutrients and it's the low operating pressure of the machine which allows us to put that out without damaging any sort of biology or anything that's in there. More diversity in our grazing paddocks, more multi-species lays, let's get sort of more roots, diversity of roots in depths that will sort of bring up um, nutrients and minerals from, other, from, from further down, improve aeration, soil structure and also perhaps a, a, a change in our grazing management slightly to manage those diverse swarms better, um, so sort of slightly longer rests, which sort of encourage some of the deeper rooting plants, um, a bit more resilience for drier spells and to maintain ground cover more often. So, hope I've told as much as I can um, on sort of what we've gained from the Tome Fit, but if you've got any more questions, I'm not a massive social media user, but um, I am on there. Um, so this is sort of a Twitter handle, if message me if you want. Uh, Facebook, we are trying to set a farm Facebook page to sort of show what we're doing. But as I say, we're not the best Facebook users, so we're getting there. Um, but in touch, you'd have Leslie's email from um, from Redstone for this evening. If you want to fire any questions through Leslie, back to me, I'm happy to answer them as well. So yeah, thank you for listening. Hope it's been informative. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing a tour through the factory. All right, Tim, All right, we'll hand over to you now. Um, if you want to make your way out to the factory, and uh, like I mentioned, people, if you've got questions for any of us, for Andrew, Mike, um, Tim, after the factory tour, then um, start typing away in the bottom of the comments section, and we'll sort those out and uh, get into those as soon as Tim has completed um, our little factory tour. So here he goes. Over to you, Tim. So here we are in the final assembly of the Tone Fert. Just a quick history of metal form. We are a privately owned company with um, approximately 120 staff here in a small town in rural New Zealand called Dinivirk. Um, and we manufacture quite a big variety of products. Um, some products for other clients, uh, which include things like outdoor TV screens for um, drive through restaurants. Uh, outdoor frost, frost protection equipment for vineyards um, and obviously a lot of our own products as well um, including Toe and Fit which you all know. Um, so Toe and Fit's about um, a quarter to a third of our business at the moment. We sell these to um, obviously across New Zealand, Australia, um, South Africa and obviously now into Ireland and Wales. Um, so in the factory we've got all the workstations set up with about six or seven guys doing the final assembly and around all the workstations are all of the parts um, that we either manufacture or purchase. Of the items that we put in a tow and fit, 
probably over 85% of these are actually manufactured here in our factory. The only things that we don't manufacture um, are items like the hydraulic equipment and the electrical equipment that we, we procure or buy in. So most of it's made right here uh, under our processes and quality control and assembled right here in our factory as well. So we control the entire process. What we see there is the 2800 nearly finished, so the same machine uh, that Andrew Rees has. Um, and down the back, just where I came from, is our 1200 three-point linkage unit. Um, nearly finished also. Over there is the basic chassis, before any work's done on it, um, of the 2800. Um, and all our chassis, as you can see, are hot dipped galvanised. So made for um, the agricultural environment. Here we have the beginning of a Toe and Fur 4000, so that is the chassis and cradle sitting in it before any other, before the tanks put in. <coughs> the one thing you'll notice with our design and product, um, which I'll come a bit closer in, is that everything's built very sturdy and some might even say it's over engineered, but the environment we know that it's working in needs to handle um, you know, a lot of hard work. So, <clears throat> This truck sitting in the middle of the workshop um, is the second truck we've built. Um, it's a multi 4000 that we're putting on the top of a contractor's truck that was um, a solid fertiliser bulky to begin with um, but due to the growing demand in New Zealand of you know, the, the farmers wanting contractors to put on folia we're seeing a, a bigger uptake of, of contractors wanting to do it themselves so this be could, could become the norm where we're seeing a tow and fit on the back of a truck um, with cranes so no additional tractors or equipments required to do any loading. Just touching on one thing that Andrew raised um, about the section control um, and rate control, sorry, um, is that we are actually working on a project right now um, with the wider design team and mechatronics team on incorporating that. So it is something we're working on um, and the initial stage will be a type of rate control that um, gives you live feedback based on the calculator um, output of what rate per hectare you should be applying and it will tell you to either slow down or speed up based on, on the live data. So just uh, a little bit on the finer detail of the units, um, we've ended up manufacturing a lot of things ourselves because things off the shelf we couldn't find to, to, to meet, match our quality um, and one of the key items that um, we designed and manufactured ourselves is the trash pump which is basically the heart of the unit and so that there is 100% stainless steel, we tried the cast iron and aluminium ones to begin with and really struggled with the longevity of them so a fully stainless steel trash pump with a work hardening impeller um, is an important part of, of making the system work. <clears throat> As you can see everything on these units is either stainless steel um, or galvanised or obviously for the tank it's plastic so everything that touches fertiliser either, is either stainless steel or plastic. Every nut and bolt is, is stainless steel. So that is a quick look at the assembly factory, um, the guys must be all hiding but all happening here um, in the same building and um, company that designed the unit so hopefully that's been helpful. Thanks Tim um, <clears throat> for that so what we've had to do just a bit of background there as well for the uh, production we've, we've experienced a surge in demand over the last sort of six to nine months um, for the product so we've really had to ramp up production um, which the team at the factory has really responded to brilliantly um, so we're now making sure that we are uh, sort of catching up on the order book as it were um, and we've got a great team in there that are manufacturing now which is fantastic so look we'll head over into questions now um, there's a bunch coming through which is fantastic 
of those were answered by uh, Tim, um, I think. So the first one that we'll get into is uh, Andrew. What mix do you use on silage ground? Um, well, our pl original plan for 2021 was to remain solid fit on silage ground while we got to grips of the machine. So half application, due to the weather then, half application of both cuts went on a solid fit and then we topped up after two to three weeks with pretty much the same as our grazing. Going forward, uh, we will probably do a more of a soil applied early spring, probably more leaning towards more sulfate of ammonia to get the sulfur in then. Um, but then we're sort of aiming to use more of our slurry for the P's and K's. So total end use would probably be somewhere between 30 and 40 per cut, I'd say, next year. But yeah, we haven't done a full season, just tow and foot um, for silage yet. Okay, cool. So the next question is, in terms of aerial emissions, will the machine be better than normal first spreader or likely that a splash plate on a slurry tanker will possibly be banned? Is there a risk that this could also be considered to be a machine that creates high emissions? Um, so Mike, I guess I'll probably uh, head this one your way. Yep. So. When I was contracting back in 2015, I think it was, we did a quite a bit of testing on a farm in Southland around this sort of stuff. Um, and one way we were testing it was actually knowing what was in the mix when we applied it to the ground and then taking herbage tests um, every week up until grazing to monitor and measure nutrients in a plant. Um, so what we were measuring was 95% of what we were applying, we were finding in the plant through that whole transition period. So that was telling us our leaching or our emission rate was sort of 5%. Um, and then we broke that down over time and worked out that about 2 to 3% of it was lost into, well, not lost into the soil, went into the soil. Um, and so that was meaning we were only losing sort of 2 to 3% through emissions that we couldn't measure anywhere. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a bit about the background of what I've tested and what I've found. Um, and people are agreeing with what they're doing on farm in New Zealand. Um, likely splash plate slurry tanker will possibly be banned. Yeah, I'm not sure what your regulations are around that over there, but if it comes back to emissions and what's getting lost and what's not happening, well, I can't see it falling into the same bracket as a slurry tanker. Yeah, that's about all I've got on that. Okay. Um... What are the benefits of the tow and fit nozzle compared to a conventional sprayer nozzle? So probably one for you, Mike, as well. Yep, so because of the low pressure, um, usually on a conventional sprayer in New Zealand, you're running sort of six bar, four to, four to six bar pressure. Um, so you're up in a couple of hundred PSI and so bacteria and stuff like that will not survive at that pressure. Um, testing we've done under microscopes, as soon as you go over about 35 PSI, you kill about 80% of bacterial microbes that are in a mix. So what we've found by running at 20 to 25 PSI, um, we're measuring no dead bacteria under a microscope. And additionally to that, the size of the nozzle is, it makes it a lot easier to put out products without blockages. So some of the products Andrew is putting out, um, whether it be the molasses or even small seeds, um, a large nozzle allows us to do that without um, blocking. And in addition to that as well, fish would be another one that uh, typically has bones and bits of fish in it that can't get through a conventional nozzle that will go through the town for as well. Okay, um, question from Eon, we've got what would the typical contractor cost be compared to a solid fertilizer application per hectare? Mike. Yep, so in New Zealand here, uh, traditional bulky spreader is around that sort of $13, 10 to $13, depending on application rate and products. But say nitrogen at 100 kilos is about $13 a hectare. Um, and our contractors, which are doing 60, sort of 50 to 60 kilos of, of urea growing the same pasture, they're, they're about $20. Yeah, it depends which part of the country they're in, but around $20 is probably the average. Okay, cool. All right. Um, 
Leslie, have you got any sort of questions for Andrew that you'd like him to elaborate on? Anyone else out there who has a question lined up, please pop it into the comments section um, and let us know what those are. But Leslie, if you'd like to sort of take the lead now, that'd be great. Yeah, just one application there from Nigel Holds. Um, Nigel's just asking about how do we adjust application rate? Do we just put more fertilizer in or we put less in? Uh, I suppose uh, there's two two answers to that, Nigel. Uh, yes, we uh, we can adjust the application rate by reducing the amount of fertilizer or indeed increasing the amount of fertilizer and equally by uh, increasing speed or decreasing speed. Generally, what, what we're doing here is we have a kind of a nearly a set rate depending on the farm and depending on the farm history. So if a farm has a history of putting on, uh, say, um, 30, 35 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per round, we generally, once they go to the, the tow and fert system, we reduce the rate down 40%. And um, so we have a mixed calculator online or we have one to an Excel sheet where we can make up the mix. And that tells us basically how much water to add into the machine, how much fertilizer to add in. Like Andrew alluded to in his mixes, he's including sulfate of ammonia, which I'm advocating here in Ireland as well to get a, a, a nitrogen to sulfur ratio of 10 to 1. And um, so the mix calculator allows us to basically um, t tells us what nozzle we need to use, what ground speed we need to uh, we need to um, run it, and uh, the amount of fertilizer and water. So that more or less tells us our application rate, um, but that's obviously keeping the speed static across the field as much as possible. Uh, so basically, we, we have different ways of, of um, adjusting the rates, um, but uh, not quite as not as flexible yet as uh, as the um, as a standard uh, granular spreader. And just to touch on that a little bit more, Leslie, uh, Tim mentioned when he took us around the factory that that is something that we are working on. So the design team are busy with that at the moment uh, to eventually make that much more controllable other than those um, uh, manual sort of efforts that you've just mentioned. So that, that will be something that will be coming in the not yeah. Tim is just trying to... Tim's just trying to access and see if we can screen share the app for you via the mobile phone. Um, so we're hoping that that comes online shortly, but at the moment we're not having much luck there. So John Carew has uh, added a question here. Andrew said his nitrogen has reduced by 60%. Is that as a result of the dry weather? And if it was a normal year, would he have used more nitrogen? Yeah, our original plan for this year was 120 kilos um, average across the farm. I think we came in sort of uh, 80 odd. So yeah, some of that is towards dry weather this year, um, but at the same point, it has tortoise stuff as well. Um, some paddocks we only put 25 kilos on, so um, it sort of reinforced some of our learning that we can go lower. Granted, there's some paddocks we've learned this, we've got things to concentrate on that they haven't responded as well. But I think that's that they are underlying issues there, and we've we've sort of tested them that this autumn that. We'll look to correct them next year. Um, so yeah, the reason we came in as low as we did, partly due to dry weather, but we had aimed to be saving at least 50% anyway. So yeah, slightly better results than originally planned, but not due, nothing's ever due to one factor. Could you talk oh. maybe, Andrew, just again on the... Um on like we we uh, we normally say that we can easily achieve the forty percent, but uh, just your the the flexibility in the system, maybe to touch on it again in terms of because you are waiting for that extra maybe five to to ten days, depending on the time of year, and um, to get the covers up to our well, you you say two two, we say about five to seven hundred here, so say cover seven hundred. Just how the system has allowed you to um, to sit back and assess how the paddocks are doing, and maybe um, to factor in soil mineralization, particularly coming to back end of the year, and how that has helped you to skip skip rotations. Could you just maybe touch on that again? Yeah, certainly. <laughs> yeah, so if, um, as we are waiting for something for that rotation has already happened, but when you're approaching paddocks, that you can almost tell as soon as you drive in the gate. But if the colour seems right, if you're measuring anyway, you know what growth rates is, or you sort of we're expecting that paddock to be, 
if you feel that banner's actually ahead where you think it needs to be, we don't need to put nitrogen on it. it it's, it's found enough itself. Um, so that's allowed us to not be blindly going every rotation. But I think we need to get away from the mindset that grass needs nitrogen to grow, that quite often it doesn't. And um, depending on farm stocking rate, that often mid season is when grass will grow by itself anywhere. That's through addition of clovers and the like or it is mineralizing in the back end that we can get we can, we can make savings there then we can start making judgments rather than following a recipe yeah okay great stuff all right thanks andrew we'll just quickly jump over to tim you should see the uh, the town food calculator app in the background there the video might get in the way a little bit but i think for the most part you can see what's going on so tim over to you to take us through the um, the calculator, if you leave it up high, it should be fine, Tim. Yeah, that's it. Can't hear you, Tim. You there, Tim? He's just having technical difficulties. So look, whilst you're figuring that out, Tim, we'll go and just get another question. Um, here. So, Andrew, um, how long have you been working on balancing the soil? Um, well, was it? Autumn 18, 2018, we did most of the farm quite detailed soil analysis or base saturations and the like. Um, so I suppose from there, really. Uh, so, where are we now? Yeah, so last last three seasons, we are sort of <coughs> made a real game of it. Okay, and how soon after applying uh, can you cut the paddocks if the cover has gone too heavy? I've no data myself to back it up, but dates, some things I have seen that you're actually only talking a couple of days. Um, but I wouldn't like to sort of say, put my hand up and say that straight out. Um, I don't know whether the mic's got any more experience than that, but some data I've sort of seen in applications made sort of a week or so before cutting and then subsequent nitrates and silage being more than acceptable. Mike, you got anything yeah. to add to that? Yeah, in New Zealand, we've found the same things. Um, people are leaving it about seven to 10 days after applying before they cut paddocks. Um, yeah, just because the otherwise nitrate levels go quite high and the silage doesn't come out the best quality. Um, yeah, but normally in New, in New Zealand with silage paddocks, people that are running into that problem now with time ferts, they are doing small, two smaller applications of fert. So if, if they have to cut early, then they get in around that nitrate level. Yeah, generally I would say that if you are applying it onto paddocks and uh, you need to cut it, seven to ten days is plenty. Uh, we, we, we've grazed paddocks after seven days um, after an application. Now, it, it obviously boils down to how much you're putting on, but if you're talking about a rate of 15 to 20 kilos to the hectare, seven to 10 days uh, for cutting, it's fine. Because at that stage, your 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 nitrogen is absorbed, is converted into protein. It's uh, what you're really looking for is, uh, is, is to maximize the value of that applied fertilizer. So uh, it's given enough time for that grass to uh, to grow, to get the value out of the application. But if you had to cut early, um, I'd have no cams in saying that within uh, seven days um, and in around 50 units would be plenty of time based on our experience here. Right, all right, thanks, guys. Can we hear you now? Yeah, you hear me now, uh, Julia? Here we go. Yep, we've got you. Okay, run us through the app. Go for it. Yeah, so we developed the app just to take the guesswork out of knowing what to put in the unit, uh, in the machine. Um, a little bit different to a straight liquid sprayer because we're dealing with um, either fine particulates or solids that dissolve. Um, it's not just all about uh, litres per hectare um, before you start you know, putting the mix in the, in the tow insert. So to take the guesswork out, all you as the operator or we as the operator need to know is the rate per kilo of the dry product that we want on per hectare and that the calculation will figure out how much water to put in to begin with um, and obviously how much fit. Uh, to put in, in total. So just as an example, um, you can select our machine and the 
type of boom setup we have, which is a jewel. And this is where we put in the products um, and whatever we want, all the different products we want and the rate per hectare. So here, um, going to select urea um, at a rate of 20 kilos to the hectare, say 25, and the total area of the job that we want to do. <clears throat> um, so moving on down, the nozzle selection is basically proportional to how fast you want to drive. So looking down the bottom of the screen here, we can see that this mix has uh, got a speed uh, suggestion of 8 k's an hour. If you're comfortable and you know your terrain, like Andrew mentioned, and you know it's flat and you can go faster, if you put a bigger nozzle on, um, that will have an increase in the speed there up to um, 10, 10 and a half k an hour, or up to 12. So going across to the mix tab, um, this is just a summary of what we worked out. It's saying the job is 15 hectares. Our total mix volume in the tank is, is 2,800 litres. No surprise. Um, our speed is 12, our nozzle is 40, and the detail around the spray width and the spray time. The key piece of information that makes it easy is telling us how much water to put in the tank. So before you, without um, you know, using a calculator of some sort, it may, it's very hard to figure out what that starting point is. So to do this job, it's suggesting that we put in 2,500 litres of water um, and only 375 kilos of urea. But all the guesswork's out. If you do an average speed of 12.8k, we will achieve exactly 25 kilos of urea to the hectare in that mix. Um, just another nice little thing. Uh, if it's loaded, if all the nutrient levels are loaded per product, it'll tell you um, the rate of your NPKs uh, or, and all the other products um, per hectare. So 25 kilos of urea is 11.5 units of N in that particular case. So very straightforward um, and very customizable to lots of different products as well. Can you just show us, Tim, adding another product? You've got urea there. Just show the section where you've got product number two, product number three, so you can just define that. <clears throat> yep, so I've just picked molasses there. And let's put in two kilos of molasses per hectare. I'm just going straight across to the next tab. Um, it's lowered the, now the amount of water to put in by a few kilos. The urea stayed the same, and the job um, to put in for the job 30 kilos of molasses in the job as well. And doing that in the calculation in the background, it's taking into account the, the weight or the specific gravity of each of those products. So it knows that 30 kilos of molasses is probably not 30 litres, um, it's probably something more like. 25. So that's what the calculator is doing really nicely in the background. It doesn't need you to figure out the, the ESG or the, the weight of every product or the, the literage of every product. Good stuff. All right. Thanks, Tim. Um, so we'll go back to our questions now. I've had another couple come in here. Um, and this one from Richard Cochrane. I presume dry weather is needed during application. Can it be used during dry, uh, sorry, during dew and damp conditions? Do you want me to answer that one, Julian? Okay, go for it, Mike. Yep, so pretty much um, dew is one of the best times to do it because the stomata in the plant naturally opens up when there's a dew around to take moisture in, so applying fertiliser there will help with uptake. Um, rule of thumb in New Zealand, if we're going to get 10 mils of rain in the next sort of four to six hours, don't, don't put it on. If it's less than that, we've found just as good a result putting it on then as if there was no, no moisture around at all. Um, but dry weather comes back to, as Andrew said earlier in his presentation, that when it gets drier, you, you run the risk of scorching. So it's about understanding the balance. Um, and in New Zealand, we ma manipulate it in the app. So it's, if we're putting on, say, a ratio of two to one, so two litres of water to a kilo of urea, that might be fine in spring and autumn. But in the summer, we might push that out at four to one so that we're putting on four litres of water per kilo of, of product put on. Um, just to help with scorching, because scorching at the end of the day is just dehydration of the plant because you've over-applied nutrients. Okay, cool. And um, Andrew, are you using effluent as your base liquid or just uh, just water? Just clean water up to now. Um, going forward, plants try some effluent. The, everything just going into one pit with us, pile washing, slurry the lot, so um, probably being too thick, but we're separating out liquid 
going forward. So I think we're going to try and, um, yeah, so we're not using clean water at the same time then. Okay, great. And how effective is applying the N at cover higher or lower than between 500 to 700? Okay, I'll take that one, Jolyn. Uh, basically, the why we say 500 as a kind of a minimum is uh, we um, we need a certain amount of leaf area for the nitrogen to be applied onto and to be taken up effectively. If you go below 500, you're going to get more, a higher percentage of the liquid mix hitting the soil, which is less effective than going through the leaf. So your efficiency levels will drop once you go below 500. If you go above 700, your efficiency levels potentially increase because you've less applying, you've less getting applied to the side and more applying to the leaf. Uh, typically, for our, our silage applications, we would be going in and covers even say up to uh, a thousand on uh, on silage, which would be 1,200 in the in the UK. Um, and so there is potential to uh, to save a bit more because you've less hitting the soil. Uh, but for grazing. Um, or well, for any for grazing our silage, the minimum for me is 500, um, and going below that, your your efficiencies will drop. Thanks, uh, Leslie. Okay, Nig Nigel House just says, uh, what is the minimum amount of water liters per hectare you would use? They might just covered that. So two to one would be yeah minimum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. so ambient temperature has an impact. We found to the speed of dissolving but sometimes a little bit more water just speeds the job along it's a bit cooler but generally if you if, if you work out we are generally using in around that 125 liters to the hectares it's kind of a rough a rough ball uh, ball point for what we're using all right um that is all the questions we have at the moment so if there's a last chance now we'll wrap this up so any more questions you want to shoot through um people then do that right now um in the meantime andrew if uh, what's your sort of goal for the next sort of um, 12 to 18 months two years what are you sort of hoping to achieve now from an nitrogen point of view it's question how low can we go without jeopardizing production but then it's also it's, it's Building everything in the whole, it's all about that diversity as well. Um, and so I listened to Maya Smith the other night. It was, can we build in sort of more biostimulants, the seaweed, the fish? Can we sort of look where our what, a nitrogen we do use, what the source of it? Um, yeah, it's basically just looking after soil health, making improvements there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more of a journey than a, a destination, I think. So, yeah, a few things I'd like to try. Just sort of yeah. a bit more, a bit more out there. So, yeah, it's no, very good. Well, we'll be sure to check in with you in eighteen months for just that reason, then, and have a catch up and see where you've come to. <laughs> so, a um, couple more questions. Uh, these will be the last ones before we uh, wrap things up. Uh, can you leave the mix in the machine overnight, uh, Mike? I'll let you uh, answer this one because there can be a couple of different answers here. Yep. So if, if it's a liquid soluble product and it, it's fully liquidized, yes, you can. You can leave it in there for a week if you wanted to. If you have any fine particulates at all that can settle out, um, definitely empty it. Otherwise, you'd be digging. Um, so, yep, if it's a liquid, good as gold. But if it's a particulate, make sure you empty it and then give it a quick rinse just so nothing's sitting in the booms and their little elbows in the pipe where everything's drained out of the tank and make sure to drain the pump. Okay, and our last question from Marie. After silage, how do you get your cover up above 500? Leslie, would that be one for you? Yeah, so basically, um, I suppose most of the farms we're working at the moment, as if our silage ground is getting slurry, we would rely on the background fertility of the soil or the slurry to get it to that level of 500. Um, uh, it would probably be... Uh, for silage fertility would have to be pretty poor for silage ground not to get to 500 on its own. Uh, so it's generally not an issue unless uh, it was a case of um, you had ground silage ground on an outside block where you weren't drawing slurry and the indexes were low. Um, uh, it might be a case that you could go with a soil drench. Sometimes we do go with a soil drench. Uh, we would give it a kickstart um, with, uh, in the springtime with some sulfate of ammonia to get some sulfur out. And around 11 units of nitrogen in around the same time as uh, as um, 
as the slurry is applied. And uh, then we would hit it with uh, 25 units of foliar in around the first week of April. Uh, but generally, after after the first cut of silage, silage is warm enough and there's enough been mineralized to get it to cover 500. And then you use the uh, the foliar application to, uh, to basically take it home after that. Awesome. And just one last question that we've got here is uh, from John. Um, Andrew, how reliable has the machine been for you? Yeah, good. They would. I spoke to Mike sort of earlier and we had one little issue, but that wasn't actually anything to do with the machine. That was, um, it was a bit of silicon on a joint or something, wasn't it, Mike? We found yeah. it in the end. It was, it was, it was a simple one, but in terms of, no, I haven't changed, I haven't changed the part or anything like that. Um, we will do a service on it this winter for seals. Um, yeah. It's, it's the same, like Tim touched on it. It's, Built like a brick shit house. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's robust. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Well, look, we'll wrap things up there. Oh, hang on. All right, Com. Last question. <laughs> Got in the nick of time there, mate. You seem to yeah. be using a lot of sulfur. Does it not lock up other minerals? It's not a lot. Um, <laughs> Ten to one is sort of. Well, it's a figure I've sort of come to from listening to the likes of John Kempf and sort of Gary Zimmer, that that's a 10 to 1 end of sulfur is what they advocate. So um, that's what I've sort of followed. Um, I yeah, I might, I, I might chip in there as well, guys. Um, yeah, I did. absolutely, Colm, you're correct. Any any element you can overdo and, and sulfur, you have to be particularly careful with. Uh, so anytime we'd be advocating, and Andrew is uh, Andrew's the same. Anytime we're advocating the, the use of sulfur, it's in a direct ratio. So um, we would be very careful putting fertilizer programs together for guys that um, we would not go over a certain level uh, per hectare per year. And um, I would uh, also advocate. Um, I would try to get as much information as possible uh, and farm background to see what the other um, minerals are in the soils and, and, and in the silage and the grass in terms of potential lockup uh, before advocating the use of sulfur. But generally, it's always um, we'd advocate a 10 to 1, so it's in a, it's in a balanced ratio. Um, in a lot of cases, we're, we're finding excess nitrogen use on, on, on a lot of farms um, and where sulfur isn't being applied. Uh, so if anything, sulfur is, is, can be quite deficient and it's actually uh, leading to excess nitrogen use um, to, to achieve, achieve grass growth. But yeah, you're correct. You always need to check. Just on that, Leslie, why are you using sulfate sulfur over elemental sulfur? Uh, basically availability, uh, Mike. Um, elemental sulfur um, is actually not available in Ireland, would you believe it? Um, I'm having right. to import it at the moment from the UK. And because of Brexit, um, the price of it just went up 160 pounds a ton for import duties and charges. Uh, we have we have lots of products um, with sulfur added, so we'd have a lot of urea product with sulfur, calcium ammonium nitrate with sulfur, sulfate of ammonia was quite easily available, um, and hopefully will be easily available next year. So it's actually easy enough for us to get um, sulfur as a fertilizer as opposed to elemental. We have one, I have one client in uh, Wexford, Richard Fortune, I believe he's on tonight. Richard has been using uh, some elemental sulfur we brought in a couple of years ago before Brexit and applying that with lime and trace minerals as a soil drench. But it's generally not that easily available here, Mike. That's the reason why. And that, and that is the only reason why, because it is, it, it, it can be cost competitive if, if it's if it's readily available. Yeah. Great. Very good. All right, everybody. Well, look, um, well, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Leslie, in particular, you guys um, uh, for arranging all of this. And thanks for everyone who is has joined us. Um, yeah, what a turnout. Fantastic stuff. Uh, so really appreciate everyone giving up their evening to join us. We will be posting the video uh, online in a couple of days so that uh, if you want to share it around or look at it again or what have you, um, you can. We'll post that on our Facebook page. We are trying to be a bit more active on Facebook now as well um, to provide a lot more information. There's a few things happening that uh, that we want to make sure that we can get out to people. So thank you, everybody, for your time. Any questions or anything, direct them to Leslie uh, and Andrew. 
Uh, Mike, Tim and myself, if you've got contact details, are also here to help. Uh, and Neil in Australia, um, probably just direct your abuse to him. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, he's, a, he's a good mate as our friend over in Aussie, good old Neil. So um, thanks, everybody. We really appreciate your time. Uh, any questions, like I say, do get in touch. Thanks very much.